Welcome to this week's TDD Weekly Report for the week ending February 20th, 2016. First up, this one was from my friend Jose Angel uh, from Bicycling.com. How does mechanical doping work? I've always kind of suspected that some bicycle riders in uh, competition and in races have done this sometime in the past, but uh, probably less chance that it's been done in the higher up races, but get, I guess now that uh, this is possibly being done, I'll, I'll, it's actually hiding tiny motors and drives inside the bicycle itself, and I'll start with the first part of the article here. Cyclocross racer Femke Van Dendrich, and I'm guessing I'm pronouncing that right, has become famous and put bike racing in the news for all the wrong reasons. The Belgian athlete has the dubious distinction of being the first rider accused of technological fraud or mechanical doping after a hidden motor was discovered in one of her spare bikes at the 2016 UCI Cyclocross World Championships. If you look at this, and uh, I will put up the picture of this too, they have a way you can even hide a lot of the gearing mechanism in the seat tube itself. And because of the fact they let a lot of racers change out bikes during the race quite often, and how do you really keep track of what the original, you know, if they've brought five or six bikes for a race and they've changed out often along the way, how do you really know if they, you know, maybe had some help? And you don't even need to have that efficient of a motor anyway. People think, well, you know, these uh, 200, 300 watt motors that you see on bicycles that you can buy yourself are not that tiny, even though they're quite small, but they're not tiny enough to really get away with and not be able to see. But you figure for a rider, especially a top conditioned athlete rider, they don't really need that much boost. They could have uh, tiny, tiny parts that just maybe give them an extra 40 or 50 watt boost just at critical times. And you could also go with way, way smaller batteries that you could hide easier in the frame because, you know, maybe during the whole race, just having an extra I don't know, five minutes of help during the hard parts of the race might be enough to give you that edge over something else. So, uh, yeah, this is something interesting that's going to happen. And uh, more and more, I think this is going to be something that's uh, discovered and maybe people did use it in the past a lot of times and got away with it. But maybe in the future, if they come up with uh, different techniques or actually uh, what they might have to do is actually have the racers actually turn over their bikes for a real critical inspection where you actually take the bike apart and... Uh, maybe do, uh, you know, destructive testing to make sure there was no kind of uh, apparatus in the bike to give you electrical assist. So that's kind of interesting uh, if you get a chance to check that article out. And this next one is from my friend Dave Netherton. I actually went to a different website. This is called thisiscolossal.com. He sent me the YouTube video that this is based on. And uh, it's uh, the Rescued Film Project discovers 31 rolls of undeveloped film shot by an unknown World War II soldier. They got 31. This is really unusual, too, for the Rescued Film Project to get 31 rolls all together, especially as well as this guy labeled them and everything, and being from World War II. Well, the um, guy that's the uh, pretty much the head of this thing, Levi Betweiser, and the Rescued Film Project, he uh, basically uses old techniques. He develops all these rolls by hand because your first roll is an experiment. These rolls are aged. You don't know what condition they are in. You don't know if you need to use extra or less of different types of chemicals or whatever, but the video goes through, and even if you're not really into World War II stuff, it's so nice and geeky to see him actually doing the old hand developing style, and each role is treated separately. Once he gets an idea of uh, you know, what a similar role can take as far as chemicals, he can do some adjustments for the next role, but it's fantastic what he got out of these rolls of film by doing them by hand, and the pictures he obtained were uh, really cool. If you get a chance, check out the videos about maybe 10 minutes long or so, so um, it's not really that bad to watch and everything, but just to uh, to see doing stuff by hand. I used to, I remember back in the days of doing a lot of the photography stuff by hand too, and uh, those days are uh, long gone for most of us, but it's still nice to see that uh, they're rescuing some parts of history, and it's not just necessarily World War II. He said uh, he rescues film from the 90s, the 80s, um, anything's considered history to him, so he takes it upon to uh, to do that, and if you uh, do a Google typing of the Rescued Film Project, you'll see even a lot more work they do. And this is an interesting one from Physics Today. Ultrasound resolution beats the diffraction limit. If you've uh, seen people's ultrasound pictures, and I guess everybody in the world, when they're having a baby, they show pictures of their ultrasound, and you know that the resolution, it's not really that great. I mean, a good doctor with some uh, good techniques and a good set of eyes can, can tell you, point to different parts and say, this is the baby's arm, this is the baby's leg, blah, blah, blah. But the resolutions are not really that good. Well, guess what? These scientists have found a way to... Uh, get past the diffraction limit. It's uh, This is kind of like more like a science paper and everything like that, but they broke the limit of the science uh, and the diffraction. I'll post a picture here. This is a uh, ultrasound image of blood vessels in the cortex of a rat's brain, and uh, the colors represent velocity, 
dark and light blue indicate blood flow. And if you look at these, I mean, these are really nice low resolution. I mean, if you can see the scale on the bottom left of the picture, that's 500 micrometers. So this technique that they've used to, to beat that limit uh, means that we might actually see Star Trek kind of, uh, you know, the Star Trek tricorder where you just basically scan somebody's body and be able to see. You could use ultrasound uh, waves to do that, and it's non-invasive. It's not going to harm anybody. But, yeah, if they can actually do something like that, it's uh, it's not too long to where we have Star Trek uh, type of uh, medical type tricorders and being able to examine, just do a scan on a human body and be able to see anything that might possibly be wrong. And then last up, I would like to talk about the U.S. Apple project with uh, decrypting. This, to me, has a lot of concerns. I mean, if you even don't talk about the constitutional concerns of it, the, the uh, constitutional concerns of it, it's looking at the fact if the U.S. government and the courts can compel somebody that has a business that uses encryption to actually come up with a tool to break that encryption, it's a lot harder to break the encryption than it is to make it. And theoretically, you have encryption such as one-time pad, which are theoretically pretty much impossible to break. So what kind of situation would you be if you were a small to medium business and they forced you to, even if you had to pay for brute force cracking it, you might have, you might need to buy three or four supercomputers and have them crunch away for weeks or months on something. If you, even if you could possibly do it that soon, the cost would just basically bankrupt you. You'd have to go out of business and not be able to do it or just face the fact of not complying with the court order. So this sets so many bad precedents in so many different ways. And uh, it basically isn't really needed. I mean, it's an easier way for law enforcement to do the same thing, but they can also, using other investigative techniques, recover a lot of the information or at least enough necessary information to do prosecution in cases. They don't always necessarily have to break encryption. They've got all kinds of access using the court and using warrants and stuff like that to uh, get all kinds of information that is actually funneled through your uh, internet service provider and your telephone provider. So they can recreate a lot of what was actually on an encrypted device and it doesn't take a lot of effort to do it, but it does take extra effort to do it compared to just having somebody rolling over and playing dead and saying, here, I'll crack the encryption for you. But meanwhile, the other person is charged with the burden of having to do that when that's not part of their business model. So. Um, putting businesses and making them have to do something like that, I, I just don't see that as being a, on a practical or a constitutional sense. I just do not see that as something I want to see happen. I, I hope it gets struck down at least as unconstitutional, if nothing else. So anyway, that's about it for this week. Take care, everybody. I'll catch you next week.